This is part one of Plato's masterpiece called The Republic. And in this video, I'm covering the bulk of book one, although I'll save a couple aspects of book one for part two. And so the question that's driving the book initially here and throughout is what is justice? That's the question. Now we have Socrates as usual, and, and this first book of the Republic looks like a, a normal Socratic dialogue. And he's interacting with Cephalus, and Cephalus, when this question is raised, suggests that justice is speaking the truth and paying debts. Now Cephalus also had some interesting insights about growing old and how he's actually glad that his appetites are decreasing, that that's a good thing, and how he enjoys conversation all the more now that he's old. Well, this, although he says that, he turns the conversation over to Polymarchus because he has to go tend to a sacrifice. So Polymarchus takes up this idea of justice and expands on it and says that justice is to give to others their due. Now, this sounds like a dictionary definition that you might find today. It uh, seems to be a fairly adequate definition. A problem that Socrates identifies fairly quickly is he says, okay, so if I have borrowed something from someone else, and then they come and ask for it back, you're saying that justice is to give back what I've borrowed. And Polymarchus agrees. And so Socrates says, well, what if I've borrowed some weapons from a neighbor, we might say, and the neighbor comes and he's out of his mind. He's not in his right mind. Maybe he's yelling about going to kill his wife and wants his weapons back. Do you give him a sword in this situation? And it seems like justice would say, no, justice, you need to protect the woman. So it's not always to give others what they're due. He is due the sword, he owns it, uh, but in that case, the just thing to do is to not give it back. And so Polymarchus says, well, maybe we can modify this a little bit and say that justice is when you do good to friends and evil to enemies. And so we have justice now bringing in these concepts of, of good and evil and friendship and enemies. And Polymarchus suggests maybe this is our best definition of justice. Now, the problem is twofold here. So the first problem is, that it's possible to confuse who are your friends and who are your enemies. So for many of us, we may have known someone that we thought we didn't like initially, and we thought uh, they were out to get us or something, and then we'd find out later that they actually had our best interests in heart or that we had much more in common than we initially thought. And of course, on the unfortunate side, we've also had some friends that we thought were good friends, but it turns out uh, that they harm us. And so it's easy to confuse. It's who is your friend and who is your enemy. And so this is not going to work with justice because if you do good to the person you consider to be a friend, but they're actually an enemy, then you can see how this is problematic. So Polymarchus wants to add a, a bit to his proposal, and he says, okay, justice is what benefits the good, which are the true friends, and harms the bad, who are the true enemies. And so this is what justice is. Now, a problem here, and I'm, uh, these numbers I'm including are, are the numbers, of course, in the margins of this standard numeration of the, the text of the Republic. If one is truly harmed, then one becomes more unjust. So that's what a real harm to someone is when you make the person unjust, says Socrates. But that would mean that justice would cause injustice on this definition. And so that's a problem, right? It's the function of justice to benefit others, to, to do what is good and right for all people. 
And so at this point, Polymarchus is refuted. This kind of dictionary definition that we started with and just we adjusted a little bit, it fails. Now, in the meantime, we have another person who wants to get in on the conversation, and that's Thrasymachus. And Thrasymachus is described as being coiled like a wild beast ready to spring. He's so anxious to get in on this conversation, and he's not too fond of Socrates. He, he tosses out some ad hominems. He says that Socrates isn't really sincere. He raises questions but never provides answers. And uh, Socrates assures him that, yes, he is very sincere in his quest to find out what justice is. He says, justice is better than gold. We can pursue it. We should pursue it. I welcome you into the conversation now. And so Thrasymachus says, here's what justice is. Justice is the interest or the advantage of the strong. That is the person who is ruling. And justice then is simply doing what those in power demand. And so you can see that Thrasymachus is a bit cynical here. He says, ah, that's all that justice is. It's just doing whatever the people in power demand. Now, the problem, of course, for Socrates is, in this case is, is that justice is going to require subjects to obey enacted laws, right? So if you do what the people in power say, you're obeying the enacted laws. But the problem now is that rulers can err. They can enact laws that are to their own disadvantage, not to their advantage. And so this is going to be self-contradictory if that happens, and it certainly can happen. So this is problematic for Thrasymachus' proposed definition of justice. So Thrasymachus takes another shot at it, and he said, okay, you know, forget your possibility of error and all those epistemological concerns you might have. Justice is the actual advantage of the stronger, and that is the person who is ruling, the person who has power. And he says, look, a craftsman, qua craftsman, you know, is insofar as they are doing what they are trained to do, that would be a leader qua leader, the one in power qua the one in power never errs. So the ruler qua ruler doesn't err, right? So your silly little idea about making mistakes is not really an issue. But Socrates brings this up and he says, well, wait a minute, crafts, you know, we want, when you introduce this idea of craftsmen, Thrasymachus, crafts are directed to the advantage of the object, and the, the object is weaker. A craftsman does what is best for the object at hand. So for example, a doctor would be considered a craftsman in this culture, does what's ever beneficial for the patient, right? That's what they're tasked to do, right? And a, a shepherd does what is beneficial to the shepherd, and a ruler is one who seeks the advantage of his subjects. Thrasymachus likes this idea of comparing a ruler to a shepherd. And he says, yes, indeed, a ruler is more like a shepherd. A shepherd shears the sheep, a shepherd butchers sheep. So yeah, that's what a ruler's like, takes advantage of those being ruled. And Socrates says, now wait a minute, a shepherd qua shepherd, a shepherd insofar as he is acting as a shepherd is only concerned for his sheep. He's protecting his sheep. He's, he's putting his life on the line to protect the sheep, getting between the sheep and the wolf to protect the sheep. So the, the shepherd, when he's acting as a shepherd, is primarily concerned for the sheep. And in the same way, a ruler is going to be concerned with his subjects. And this is why rulers demand pay. They need the pay because they're making the sacrifices to do what is best for their subjects. So the, the problem with this shepherd analogy, Socrates explains later, is that, look, qua shepherd, of course, he's concerned for the sheep. You bringing up shearing and butchering the sheep, that's 
that's a person acting qua banqueteer, you know, or qua businessman to make money. That's when they're not acting qua shepherd insofar as they are a shepherd. They're taking on different roles, in other words, when they're going, when they're shearing the sheep for profit or butchering the sheep to serve. So that's something different. Now, uh, Thrasymachus takes another shot at this and he shifts the strategy and he says, okay, look, it's really the life of injustice that's more profitable and the person who is unjust is wiser than that life of a person who is just. Thrasymachus finally just sheds his facade and says, we're not worried. I, I don't really think justice is good anyway. I think the best life is the life of injustice. That's more profitable. You can take advantage of others. It's better for you. Now, Socrates says, now wait a minute. Injustice is divisive. So if you're in a group, and there's an interesting dialogue there, but if you're in a group of thieves, say, for example, you have to work together. You have to rely on one another. You have to trust one another. You have to be honest with one another. To, and the bigger the job to pull off, the, the more complex it is, the more you have to rely on one another and you team up together. And if you're, somebody is unjust within that group, then it's divisive, the group's not going to work, and that makes everything fall apart. So injustice is divisive and therefore weak, and injustice on an individual level is the same. It ends up with a person being in this internal state of civil war, right? Injustice among the thieves would be a state of civil war. Individually, when a person is unjust, they are also in an internal state of civil war. Their reason is fighting against their emotions, fighting against their spirit, part of the soul, which we'll talk about in, in future parts. And this is a good place to stop. We'll follow up on what, how the dialogue goes from here when Thrasymachus has made several attempts and failed.